we are told in inspiration in Mount of Blessings, page 13. Let's read this together. What it says here, it says throughout, let's go, throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. So if I want to advance in the Christian experience, I must take these steps that we find in these Beatitudes. These Beatitudes show us an advancing line. If you also want to advance spiritually, if you want to grow spiritually, Christ is saying to you that you must study, you must analyze, you must apply these Beatitudes to your life. We have covered the first two Beatitudes. Let's focus now on the third step. Look with me. Matthew chapter 5. Are we there? It says here in verse number, in verse number 2, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We covered these two Beatitudes before. Let's focus now on the third step, on the Christian experience. It says, blessed are whom? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what is the promise for those who are meek? They shall inherit the earth. If I want to inherit this earth, not this thing down here, not this old earth, Bible says this earth will all pass away. But to inherit the new earth, the Bible says I must live so Christ can declare me meek. How many of us want to enter New Jerusalem? Raise your hand. Now, how many of us want to enter the new earth? Raise your hand. If you want to enter this new earth, you must also live so Christ can declare you meek. And this word meekness, to be meek, this word meekness means humility. Take your notepapers, get your sermon books, your notebooks, get your writing instruments, take some notes this afternoon on the Sabbath. This word meekness, it means humility. That's the root word, to be humble. And the Bible also shows us that this word meekness, it means self-control in a crisis. What does it mean? It means self-control in a crisis at this. Meekness means self-control during a time of provocation. Self-control during times of trials. Self-control in a time of tribulation. This is what meekness means. And unless we have self-control in a time of provocation, in a time of crisis, we are not going to inherit this new earth, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Hold your place in Matthew chapter 5. Let's turn our Bibles to Psalm 37. This is one scripture that defines that meekness represents self-control during times of provocation. When people provoke me, I must not say I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. That is sinful. And if I do not change, I'm going to be lost. And that's what many of us are. When someone verbally persecutes us, verbally malign our characters, physically persecute us, we retaliate negatively in thought, in word, in action. This is not meekness. That is weakness. Biblical meekness is not weakness. It is strength. Because naturally, the flesh wants to rise up. Naturally, the flesh wants to show the other person who is boss, who is in charge. Naturally, we want to show and we want to protect and preserve self who was hurt. So meekness based on scripture is not weakness. Meekness is strength. It is self-control in a time of provocation. Look with me. At Psalm 37, where are we going to? And this is where Christ pulled and repeated the beatitude in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 4. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5 verse 5. Look with me now. Psalm 37. Are we there, my friends? The Bible is telling us if someone provokes me, if someone speaks ill, try, trying to destroy my character, if someone provokes you, 
verbally or physically, verbally or physically persecute you, the Bible says uh, cease from anger, cease from sinful thoughts. Just give the battle to Jesus and he will deal with it. That is meekness. For the Bible says those who provoke you, those who persecute you verbally and even physically, if they do not change one day, we shall look for them and they will not be found. They will not inherit the earth, the new earth, but the meek shall inherit the earth. This is serious. Psalm 37. Are we there, my friends? Look at verse number 8. Many times we extract verses from their context. Look at the context of those who must be found meek by Christ. Verse number 8 of Psalm 37. It says, cease from anger and forsake what? Wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Why? For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall do what? They shall inherit the earth, verse 10, for yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be, but whom? But the meek shall inherit the earth. So what is meekness, friends? It is a self-control in a time of verbal and physical persecution you do not retaliate with sinful words sinful thoughts sinful actions but you give it to jesus this is what it says in verse number in verse number nine for evildoers shall be cut off but those that do what wait upon the lord Verse 10, the wicked one day will not be found. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. It is self-control in a time of provocation, in a time of persecution. Is that clear, my friends? If it's clear, say amen. Note this on your sermon notes. The Bible tells us in the 15th chapter of Revelation, verse 2 and verse number 3, that those who overcome in these last days, they must sing the song of Moses and sing the song of the Lamb. And the Lamb is Jesus Christ. So those who go through the mark of the beast crisis, they must sing what song? The song of Moses and the song of Jesus. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And verse number 15, the Bible says uh, to sing a song, it means to have an experience. So those who will overcome in these last days must have the true experience of Moses. They must have the true experience of Jesus Christ. Why am I introducing that point? Because the Bible tells us that Moses was declared a very meek man. Go with me to Numbers chapter 12. Now, friends, we know this already, right? Moses was declared how? A very, that's a superlative, a very meek man. Look with me at Numbers chapter 12. And the beatitude that we are analyzing, this experience that we must have, safe to serve international also, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Moses was declared, a very meek man. I went back to Numbers 12 because I wanted to see the context of that declaration from Jesus Christ to Moses. Moses, a very meek man. What was going on in Numbers chapter 12 when the Bible says the Lord declared Moses a very meek man? The Bible tells us that he was being provoked by his siblings. He was being prov who was his siblings? Who were his siblings? Aaron and Miriam. Look with me at Numbers chapter 12. Look with me at verse number 1. Verse number 1 says, And Miriam and Aaron spake what? How? Spake against Moses. Because of whom? The Ethiopian woman whom he had married. 
for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Why is that phrase mentioned twice? An Ethiopian woman, an Ethiopian woman. I'm going to come back there. Look at verse 2. And both Aaron and Miriam said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not also spoken by us? And the Lord heard it. Now in parentheses, verse number three. Now the man Moses, let's read, was very what? Was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So what was Moses encountering when God declared him a very meek man above all others upon the earth? What was he encountering? Provocation, persecution, verbally from his siblings. Number one, in verse number one, Aaron and Miriam, if you will look at it, they were trying to destroy the marriage of Moses. They were trying to destroy Moses' household. And likewise, many of us are going to encounter this. When siblings, a sister, a brother is trying to come between you and your wife and they try to criticize your wife or criticize your husband. They're trying to destroy your marriage, destroy your home. How would you feel if a sibling is someone tries to destroy your marriage and to destroy your home? How would you feel? Naturally, how would you feel? Don't look at me with your frown. Come on. Talk to me. How would you feel? So naturally, you would react negatively. But how did Moses react? He gave it to whom? He gave it to God. This is meekness. Self-control in a crisis. And what I saw also, this was a second test for Moses. Because down there in Egypt, Moses had failed. The test of meekness when he slew that Egyptian down there. Isn't that so, friends? And he had to flee and spend 40 years in that wilderness. And when he came back, as God brought him back, he was very meek. Very meek. This is meekness. So now, how many of you, don't raise your hand. I know some of you are going through it. How many of you have encountered family members, so-called friends, trying to get between you and your spouse, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your home. And my question is, if you have encountered that, how were your thoughts? What were your words? What were your actions? If your thoughts, words, and actions were not in harmony with God's character, having self-control, you failed the tests, plural. You failed the tests. And if you continue to fail, many of us, when we keep seeing the same persons, uh, friends, we might not say anything. But our countenances turn red. We start perspiring. We start huffing and puffing to blow the house down. <laughs> to blow the person away. And if they ever dare cross your path, you'll give them a piece of your mind. Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. Are you heading towards glory, friends? If so, you have to demonstrate meekness, self-control in a time of provocation. And if you have not yet encountered this, it's coming. Do you know how many people I've heard say, Pastor, you don't know, that woman has destroyed my marriage flaunting herself and has taken away my husband. Don't just blame the woman. Blame also the husband. Or vice versa. What were your thoughts? Oh, my friends. What were your words? What were your actions? Again, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit thee. Skip on down to verse number 2 of Numbers chapter 12. I love these beatitudes. You know, my friends, because we all think we know them already. And as we were talking as a family, Hillary said, do you realize the most simple beatitudes are the ones that are the deepest? 
richer in meaning. Blessed are the meek. Oh, I know that one. Let's move on. Is that so? Look at verse number two. It says, and they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? What were they saying? What were they implying? They, they were questioning the Christian experience of Moses. They were trying to destroy the ministry that God gave to Moses in the eyes of the people. How would you have responded if someone tries to belittle you in public? Hmm? How would you respond if some, a co-worker tries to disgrace you, embarrass you on the job before every other co-worker? How would you respond? What would be your thoughts, my friends? Blessed are the meek. Meekness, Bible meekness is not weakness, friends. It is strength. It's Christ's strength. It is self-control in a time of provocation. I know what I'm talking about. All these beatitudes are personal. God has brought people in this ministry safe to serve. And some, those who I have drawn the closest to me, have tried to overthrow this ministry. Writing letters, putting people aside saying, Pastor Andrew Enriquez doesn't know what he's doing. Let me show you how things need, 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 needs to be done. These, this, is Mary, this is Miriam and Aaron all over again. All over again. Hold your place in close Numbers chapter 12. Go to Proverbs 25 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Proverbs chapter 25. And friends, as I got wind, knowledge of what was going on in the church just a few years ago, as a termite eating out the wood, those who are unconverted in the church claiming to be so superior. And bear in mind, Miriam was older than Moses, was she not? Aaron was older than Moses. So what they were saying was simply, Moses, we are older than you are. We are your superior. You need to relax. We are the ones who can lead. We are the ones who should be preaching. We are the ones who must get the limelight, the bright lights. We must be in front of the cameras. God can also use us. It was pride. But the question is, how did Moses respond? Very meek, self -con he gave it to God. Do you see, friends? And did God deal with them? Did God deal with them? Look at Proverbs 25. And I have seen God dealt with these, deal with these individuals. Look with me at Proverbs 25. I want to tell you something, friends. Self rose up. Self rose I was livid as I heard those, those sentiments. By and by, God moved them out the way. And if God could do that for me, he can do it for you, friends. It doesn't matter who tries to provoke you, verbally persecute you, physically abuse and hit you and try to destroy your character and to weaken your influence in the church, on the job, even before your children. Ask God for meekness. And what is meekness? Do you know what I thought? Let me just get this off my chest, as we would say. Let me just tell her what I'm thinking. And then afterwards, I'll go and pray. That's not strength. That is defeat. That is weakness. But when I have to sit there and take it like a man. Ah, oh, friends. And you see them, and as the thoughts are coming, you say, Lord, have mercy. Casting down imaginations. That is not weakness. That is self-control. That is the strength of Jesus Christ. And Proverbs 25 puts it this way. Look with me. Proverbs 25, verse 21 says, If thine enemy... Be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him what? Water to drink, for thou shalt do what? He coals a fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. The battle is not yours. The battle is whose? The battle is the Lord's. Again, what is that third beatitude? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit thee earth and who was called a very meek man 
Now, friends, this point is shocking because Moses was called a very meek man, and the meek shall inherit what? The earth. Yet, Moses did not enter, did not inherit the earthly promised land. The meek shall inherit the earth. Moses did not put foot in the earthly promised land of Canaan. Why? He lost it. Okay, what did he lose? Do you see it, friends? The man who was once declared a very meek man. Look with me at Numbers 20. When he got to the borders of the earthly promised land, the Bible tells us the children of Israel provoked Moses. Provoked him. And how did Moses respond? It says he took that rod. And firstly, he said, look, I could just see him. You rebels, must we fetch water for you? And he smote the rock twice. And what did God say to him? Numbers 20, verse 1 through verse 12. What did God say to him? Because you have done this, you won't enter. Now, let me pause here. He repented thereafter, and God put him to rest, didn't enter the earthly promised land, but God brought him to heaven, amen, based on scripture. But that account is left on the pages of holy writ for a purpose, that God is no respecter of persons. The meek shall inherit the what? The earth, not something literally on this sinful earth, but the new earth, meekness, self-control in a time of provocation. And notice, the very people, listen to me, the very people that Moses was leading to the promised land were the very ones that Satan worked through to provoke him and cause him to demonstrate a lack of meekness. What is the application then, friends? The provocation is going to start in our homes. The provocation is going to start where? In our homes. It's going to start even in Safe to Serve, even in Safe to Serve international places of worship. The very souls he was leading, the same ones provoked him. But again, we can't blame the people 100% for his failure because we must come to the point in which even though we are provoked, we will not retaliate negatively. There will be no sinful thoughts, no sinful words. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth on the borders of Canaan. Moses manifested a lack of meekness. And the application is, as we come, do you see it now? As we come to the close of this earth's history, the borders of the heavenly promised land, the borders of the new earth, the majority of God's professed people are going to demonstrate a lack of meekness and die in this wilderness. And they will not have the experience like Moses to repent, die, and be Raised in the special or the first resurrections. No, you would die lost. So now Christ is allowing us to go through crises, provocations daily. For what purpose? So we can develop meekness. Manifest meekness. Why? Because in these last days, all of us will have to manifest meekness, self-control in a time of provocation. Look how Zephaniah puts it. Find the book of Matthew, New Testament. Go, one, go back one book, Malachi. Go back to Zechariah. Go back to, 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 to Haggai. Go back now to the book of Zephaniah. Look with me. Zephaniah chapter 2. Where are we going to, friends? Zephaniah chapter 2. And what God is showing me, look at Moses. For 40 years, the man manifested meekness. How long, friends? 40 years. And one day, he came to the borders of the earthly promised land. And as you all said, he lost it. 
So God is showing me, you must have a daily experience of dying to self. And this destroys, this shatters, it crumbles to dust. This whole idea of once saved, always saved. It must be a daily experience. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. amen. We must not try to preserve self. Give it to Jesus. Look with me. Zephaniah what chapter, friends? Zephaniah chapter 2. Look at verse number 1 with me. Underscore the first word in verse 1. Father in heaven, give us more understanding, we pray, in Christ's name. What's that first word in verse 1? Don't forget that word. It says, gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together. O nation not desired. When must we gather? Verse 2, before. The decree, underscore this, before. The decree bring forth. Before. The day pass as the chaff. Before. The fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before. The day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Verse 3, seek you the Lord. All you meek of the earth, that's your word, which have wrought his judgment. What must we seek? Let's read. What must we seek? Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So the Bible is clear. Before a certain decree, hold your place in Zephaniah. Go with me. Chapter 14 of the Revelation. Where are we going to? Chapter 14 of the Revelation. Hold your place in Zephaniah. The Bible is clear that before a specific decree goes forward, the Bible says we must seek righteousness. We must seek what? Meekness. Before that specific decree goes forward. We can never look at that beatitude the same way as we have done before. This is not precious pleasant truth this is present truth before this decree goes forward the bible says we must seek righteousness we must seek meekness and linked with this decree that will one day go forth the bible says in that time the fierce anger of god will be poured out what will be the manifestation of god's wrath god's anger talk to me is the seven last plagues. Write this text down. Chapter 14 of Revelation. Verse number 10. All right. One more scripture. Chapter 15 of Revelation. Verse number 1. One more scripture. Chapter 16 of Revelation. Verse 1 and verse number 2. So now, this fierce anger is the seven last plagues. But before the seven last plagues come, Zephaniah 2 says a decree will be enforced. A decree, a law will go forth. What law is connected to God's wrath, God's anger, God's seven last plagues being poured out? It's the mark of the beast. What text say that? Chapter 14 of Revelation and verse number 9. So what must we seek before? The mark of the beast is enforced. Talk to me now. Let's connect those dots now. We must seek what? Righteousness. We must seek what? Meekness. Why? When the mark of the beast is enforced, we must manifest Christ's righteousness. And righteousness is right doing. We must manifest Christ's meekness. If not, we are not going to be saved. Is that clear, my friends? So how close are we then to the enforcing of the mark of the beast? The enforcing of Sunday as the day of worship in the land and persecution for those who refuse to bow. We are very, very close. Close Zephaniah. Potent scripture, right? Do you see how potent that scripture is? Do you see how it puts flesh on the skeleton? Of Matthew 5 verse 4, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We must receive meekness before this decree goes forward. Close Zephaniah. Go with me. Chapter 17 of the Revelation. Where are we going to? Chapter 17 of Revelation. Just mark these verses. Verse number 1 speaks about a great whore. A great what? 
a great whore. And who does a woman, talk to me now, who does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church. A virtuous woman represents the true church. Amen. And the harlot, the whore, points to what? The apostate, pagan church. And the Bible tells us in verse number two that this church, this whore, she mingles with the kings of the earth, the princes, the rulers of the earth, and cause the leaders of the earth to partake of her wine. And what does the wine represent? Her doctrines, her teachings, her system of falsehood, false worship. Question now, which church above every other church has a person, a leader, who mingles with every other nation and the leaders of these nations, even the religious leaders of these religions. Which church is this? This is Roman Catholicism. This is the only church that mingles and sits and commits fornication with the kings of the earth. Roman Catholicism is the only system, hear me carefully, with a man who sits, has a place in the United Nations. A church leader sitting among the kings, United Nations, no other church. This is popery. This is the papacy. And the Bible tells us once the popery, once the papacy begins to mingle with these nations, mingle with these churches, the next thing is persecution for God's people. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 is coming again. It says, well, skip on down to verse 5. Verse 5 says, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And verse 6 says, and I saw the woman drunken with what, friends? The blood of the saints with the blood of the martyrs. This has happened. It's coming again. Look with me. Chapter 16 of Revelation. Where are we going to, friends? Chapter 16 of Revelation. Just mark these verses. If you have any questions, please see me afterward. Verse 13. Verse 14. Bible tells us that this same power is going to bring about an unholy alliance with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And verse number 14 says uh, that the papacy will be gathering people to persecute God's commandment keeping people. So while the papacy is gathering her agents, Zephaniah chapter 2 we read, it's time for God's people to be gathering unto him. To be having a holy gathering. Stop going to churches where the pastors and elders are playing games in the pulpits. It's time to seek God's righteousness, God's meekness. That's the only way we are going to stand. Are these scriptures being fulfilled right now? Yes, look at the screen. It says here, I am, this is the Pope speaking. He says, I am certain that this jubilee year will be a favorable occasion for the cold indifference of so many hearts to be won over by the warmth of mercy, that precious gift of God which turns fear into love and makes us artisans of peace in the bowl of indiction of the extraordinary year of mercy. Pope Francis made it clear he did not wish to turn the holy year into a favorable time exclusively for faithful of Catholics active in the faith. He intended the year of Jubilee, which is going on right now, as an opportunity for what, friends? For reconciliation, for non-Christians too, starting with Jews and whom? And Muslims. He is going to bring about this false union. And once this union begins, persecution for God's people. It's time to seek God's righteousness. 
It's time to seek God's meekness in order for Pope Ray to bring about the false union. He must control the publishing press. The what, friends? The publishing press and the digital press. What do I mean by that? If you understand the Protestant Reformation with men like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Huss and Jerome and the rest, the Protestant Reformation protesting against Popery extended largely because the reformers were preaching, but not only preaching, they were publishing God's words. They were printing Bibles and distributing Bibles all around the world. Is that clear? Somebody could be in Germany and others in Switzerland, in, in, in England, receiving the gospel. Why? They were using the printing press. And Pope knows the power of the printing press. The power of the digital press. I'm talking about social media. The internet. I can be right now in the Western Hemisphere, and within a few minutes, be communicating with somebody in the Eastern Hemisphere. So now, for Popery to control and to bring about this one world government, one world religion, Popery must control the internet. And that's what he's saying. Look at this. Listen to what it says. The Pope speaking. God invented the internet, the Pope said this, and then offered it to us as a gift. He says, we need to resolve our differences through forms of dialogue. Then he says, media can help us greatly in this, especially nowadays when the networks of human communication have made unprecedented advances. The internet, the Pope says, in particular, offers immense possibilities for encounter and what? And solidarity. So what is the Pope saying he must use to bring about union in the world? A one world government, a one world religion. He says he's gonna use the internet. And listen what he says. He met, oh, have mercy. He met uh, with all these men. Can you see them? <laughs> he met with Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Microsoft giant, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. All these men are saying, Mr. Pope, we are in harmony with your agenda. But what is the agenda of Popery based on scripture? To bring about a one world government and a one world religion and those who refuse to be in league to be in harmony with the one world government and the one world religion must be persecuted is that day upon us listen now we saw he met with uh, this man from google eric smith i want you to listen he's controlling the internet he says watch and eric schmidt from Google says, Mr. Pope, whatever you say, I'll do it. He says, I want to work with you to make your points. We will make it happen. And then the Pope met with Apple's CEO, Tim Cook. In a message, listen carefully, in a message published on the same day that the Twitter-friendly pontiff, Pope Francis, met whom, friends? Apple boss Tim Cook. Francis said, digital technology and the internet, let's read, could help bring people how? Together. But also have the potential to create what? Deep wounds. So the Pope says, we can use the internet to bring about a union. Or it can be used to bring what? Separation. So now, what is the agenda of Popery to bring about a union. The national Sunday law and persecute God's commandment keeping people. Then he says, watch, social networks can facilitate relationships and promote the good of society. 
But they can also lead to what, friends? Further polarization and division between individuals and groups. The Pope now says the digital world is what? Is a public square. In other words, the Pope is saying the internet is going to be the place for the great showdown between righteousness and unrighteousness. The internet is the place for the next battle. He's meeting with them. And look at this, what he said recently. Do you know what's going on now with Apple and the FBI? The FBI is saying, we want Apple to give us a backdoor to open up this specific iPhone, right? To retrieve in personal information from this so-called terrorist that wreaked havoc in, in California, right? And Apple is saying, no, we won't do that. And now they're in court. You see, friends, apparently it seems as if Apple, its leader, is not in harmony with the powers that be. Remember now, chapter 18 of Revelation says, the people who are billionaires, they are billionaires because of the whore. Ah, friends. Notice now, just like we have a Republican or the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, we think that we're really getting two different options. But no, it's a drama. It's a facade. Because anyone who enters the White House, whether Republican or Democrat, will be on the string of the puppet master. So what's going on with Apple and the FBI is just a facade. Listen now. It says here in the Economist article, it says uh, citizens have a right to both what? Security and uh, privacy. The difficulties arise when these two rights are in uh, conflict. And notice, this is now Mr. Gates, Bill Gates weighed, weighed in. And he said, Bill Gates said, listen, Either as a people, we want security or liberty. But in order, listen, for us to have security, we must give up liberty. In other words, he's saying, the government must have access to your private information. And this thing in San Bernardino, the massacre there, and all of a sudden, the shooter had an iPhone. He's now dead. What liberty does he have? He's dead, so-called. So now they're saying, Apple must give the government opportunity now, the permission now, the tools now, to be able to open up people's iPhones. And if they can do, do, do it with one phone, also with other phones. And the argument is, uh, do you want security? Now, what are the people saying? Yes, we want security. Now they're saying, you must give up what? Your liberty. Hold your place. Look with me. Chapter 8 of Daniel. Where, where are we going, friends? Chapter 8. Of, this is serious, Father in heaven. Give us understanding here in Christ's name. The whole issue here with Apple and the FBI is if you want security, you must give up liberty. Oh, friends. And we are told our liberties will be repudiated. What happened September 11, 2001? The Patriot Act overnight was written up and passed, signed into law. And what are we now experiencing? We are giving up liberties for so-called what? Security, but we get neither. Do you see, friends? This is the agenda of the papacy. It's the mark of the beast near. So now what Apple is going to say, look, I was trying, but security is superior. We want security, so now I must yield and give out the information. It is coming either directly or indirectly. And don't be deceived. Apple has given the FBI, the government, information, 
private information about people over 70 times before. Look at this. Chapter 8 of... This is, a, this is a drama, friends. Verse 25 says, Speaking about the papacy, and through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by what? And by peace shall he destroy many. Question, friends. Does peace and security have a, a harmonious link? I want peace. I want security. So what is the agenda of the papacy? To get the people to be crying out for peace, security. And as they cry for peace and security, the Bible says, uh, Popery will destroy many. Hear me now. Not many, which only means people, God's commandment keeping people. So once the world is crying out for peace and security, what is coming for God's commandment keeping people? Persecution. How close are we, friends? And this phrase, by peace shall he destroy many, it also means destroy many, destroy many principles of our U.S. Constitution. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So now, the papacy, he's meeting with Facebook giant, Microsoft, Apple, Google. Look at this. You can't see it. But just this week, Pope Francis, he met with uh, the CEO of uh, Instagram. What's going on, friends? Do you not see how Pope Francis is controlling the leaders of the internet? It says, uh, listen to these words. It says, uh, we spoke about the power of images to unite people across different cultures and languages. The power of what? Images. And what did Nebuchadnezzar set up in Daniel chapter 3 to unite all cultures? All tongues and languages, the image, the golden image. And what were the people instructed to do? To fall down and worship that image. Do you see it, friends? And now there, but remember, the Pope says the internet is going to be the public square for the showdown. He must control the internet. Is it going on right now? So how close are we to the mark of the beast, friends? Are you going to bow? So how will you retaliate when you are verbally and physically persecuted? Do you have the righteousness of Christ? The meekness of Jesus Christ? Look at this. Then we had Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not sure if you could see this one. Mark Zuckerberg says, now who is Mark Zuckerberg? Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, he says, there is no tolerance for hateful speech on Facebook. Now, how do they define hate speech? If you preach against this thing called alternative lifestyle, that's a hate speech. That means you cannot preach against the LGBT, the sins of the LGBT community. Do you remember in chapter 19 of Genesis when the men of Sodom knocked on Lot's home and Lot said, do not do such evil things. And the men said, who made you a judge over us? Very, very soon now, that means if you're on Facebook, social media sites, and you are sharing gospel-related materials, present truth, very, very soon, they are going to say that is hate speech. Oh, my friends. That means those of us who preach and share the principles of God's three angels' messages are going to be called heretics, fanatics, terrorists, Look at this. Now, this is Obama. And Obama says, we've got to make sure 
that hate crimes are punished. We have to be consistent in condemning hateful rhetoric. Rhetoric. And what do they call hateful rhetoric? He says, watch. He says, we have, an un we have to understand an attack on one faith is an attack on all of our faiths. So that means if you preach against Babylon, oh friends, can you see it? If you preach against the daughters of Babylon, if you preach the everlasting gospel, you are going to be called a terrorist. Chapter 13 of the Revelation is the mark of the beast near. It's time for us to be gathering. Father in heaven, give us more of your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Look, friends, in chapter 13 of Revelation, the Bible tells us it's time for us to be seeking Christ's meekness. You're not hearing me, friends. It's serious. And some of us, I don't really believe, get what God is saying. Look at verse 3. Verse number 4 says, When Pope is about to return to world dominance, the Bible says, all the world will begin to wonder after her. Verse number four says, and they worship whom? The dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Let's read now. Who is able to make war with him? Pause right there. So when the deadly wound of the papacy, is about to be completely healed. In other words, when the man of sin, when Pope is about to return to world dominance, Bible says uh, nobody would dare challenge the Pope of Rome. Watch, is this going on right now? Do you remember, let's see, do you remember this man called Donald Trump? <laughs> when he tried to accuse the Pope that he is the one who's not Christian, Trump backed off. Hear these words. Trump said, what? He says, telling CNN that the Pope is a what now? He changed his rhetoric. The Pope is a wonderful guy. I don't think this is a fight. I do not want to fight with the Pope. He's a wonderful guy now. Who is able to make war with the Pope? Is he regaining world dominance? And oh, and just this week, Obama said, I want to close Guantanamo Bay prison in Cuba. Listen to me carefully now, friends. And he's struggling, so-called, to close Gitmo prison. And who did Obama turn to? To receive some help to close the prison, he turned to the Pope. Why? Because he says the Pope has geopolitical power and influence. It's chapter 13. Go back to verse 3. It says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Let's read. And all the world wandered after the beast, its prophecies amassing great geopolitical influence even right now. Is the mark of the beast near? He, listen, listen, we know this, but I want to show you something here. It says uh, the U.S. is perhaps hoping, let's read, the Vatican's many what? International connections could convince countries to change their minds and take detainees into their own facilities. Listen now. It says, opened in 2002. The prison has held hundreds of suspects without a trial. Hear me carefully now. So that prison in Cuba, who is there? Who are they holding there, friends? Were they charged? Listen, were they charged? Were they charged? Have they received their rights based on the Constitution? Oh, friends, have they been tried? How long have they been there? Since 2002. What year is it now, friends? And God is showing us what is now going on 
at Gitmo, and Gitmo is not the only, well, it's not secret. There are many more secret prisons all around the world where they capture people whom they label as terrorists. As what? Oh, you need to listen. As terrorists, their constitutional rights are stripped away, repudiated. They have no trial and they sit there and just waste away. Can you imagine, friends? And their family members are calling them, can't get them. Letters are being written, no response. Where is your loved one? Lord have mercy. And God is showing us what is going on now is just a foretaste. It's a type of what is going to happen to God's commandment keeping people without a trial. Watch this. John chapter 15. Go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? John chapter 15. And who do they put there? People whom they claim to be terrorists. Now, friends, I want to ask you a question. Who do they label as terrorists? What are the many definitions of who terrorists are from the mouth of the White House and the Pope of Rome? Those who are fundamentalists, they are terrorists. Those who refuse, hear me, those who refuse to build bridges. Those who refuse to go along with uniting as a one world government, uniting as a one world religion, they are terrorists. Now, who are those people? The majority of them are God's commandment keeping people. So who are they going to put in those secret Guantanamo Bay prisons? God's commandment keeping people. You say, Pastor, I don't believe it. Well, friends. Here's God's word. Where did they put John the Baptist? Where? And John preceded the first advent of Christ. And just before the second advent of Christ, God's faithful preachers who would not be afraid to say, Herod, civil leader, leave that man's wife alone. Why? Because Herod was mingling with a harlot. Just as Popery, the harlot, is uniting and mingling with the princes, presidents, prime ministers of the world. We are the John the Baptists. Just as John the Baptist said to church leaders, you are a generation of vipers. Church and state, friend, that's Bible, not my opinion. And where did they put John the Baptist in prison. Was he at the point of discouragement? He sent men to Christ and Christ sent them back saying, John, hold fast to my promises. Do we have the righteousness of Christ? Do we have the meekness of Christ? Who are terrorists? Watch. Let's move on. It says, watch. The Pope says, listen, fundamentalists, Fundamentalism, instead of creating a what? Bridge. Create a wall that blocks encounter with another person. Fundamentalism seeks ways to disagree. So now, who would they call us? What would they call Bible-believing Christians? Terrorists. It says, with fundamentalism, he said, you can't have friendship between peoples. Let's move on. And then the Pope says, a terrorist, a fundamentalist, doesn't have to kill people. Just his thoughts make him a fundamentalist. Just his, oh, friend. Just his word, listen to what a pontiff said. He says, pontiff. He says, uh, fundamentalism is in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. He says, a fundamentalist group, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, it's violent. Why? The mental structure of fundamentalism is violence in the name of God. That's a direct attack against God's people. So when they say terrorists, they are not just talking about those who put on vests with grenades and blow themselves up, friends. 
But those who do not want to build bridges with religions, those who are preaching what they call hate messages. Question for you. Do you believe Bible history? What happened to the Protestant, uh, the Protestant reformers? What happened to them? Were they hunted and persecuted? Look at John chapter 15 with me. Where am I going to, my friends? So what is coming for God's people? Verse number 20. Verse number 20. It is Christ who says in verse 20. Let's go together. What he says, friends? Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is what? Is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also what? Persecute you. Stop right there. Did they bring Christ to prison? No. Did they, friends? And what is Christ saying? As they did to me, they will do to you. So question, who are they going to put in prison very, very soon? Those who follow Jesus Christ. And Christ now says in verse 25, those people in Gitmo, have they been tried? Have they been charged? No. Look at verse 25, John chapter 15. It says, Christ says, but this cometh to pass, that the word might be what? Fulfilled. That is written in the law. Let's read. They hated me without a cause. And the Pope is now saying, listen, this week he's, listen, this week he said, he said, we owe everybody. Let's all unite. Let's end the death penalty. And everybody goes to sleep now. You see, the popery, the papacy has changed. But what does the Bible say? Go back with me. It's a leopard, friends. And the leopard will not change. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. Chapter 13 of the Revelation. What does verse 15 say? And he had power to give life unto what? The image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. Is the death penalty going to be applied to God's commandment keeping people who refuse to give up the Sabbath and keep Sunday? Is it coming? Listen to this, friends. G.C., great controversy, page 54 says, in the 6th century, when, friends? 538. The papacy had become how? Firmly established. What happened based on history when Pope became firmly established? It says Christian. Let's read. Christians were forced to choose either to yield their integrity and accept the what, friends? The papal ceremonies and worship or to wear away their lives in dungeons or what? Or suffer death by the rack, the faggot, or the herdsman's axe. So when Popery returns, what's going to happen to God's people, friends? Most are going to be placed in prisons. Others will suffer martyrdom. And my question is, what should we now be seeking? Christ's righteousness, Christ's meekness. Do you know what the Department of Justice said? He says, it, Lord, help us. He says, if we label you a terrorist, you don't have constitutional rights. It says, watch, it says, uh, in his most forceful defense, yet of the Obama's administration's use of lethal what? Force against U.S. citizens linked to what? Terrorism. The attorney, Eric Holder, said Monday that the what, friends? The Constitution does not protect U.S. suspects plotting to what? Kill other Americans. But again, remember, those who are terrorists don't have to kill anybody. 
just their mental makeup if they choose not to unite with other religions, with other nations. If they preach separation, they are terrorists. In other words, once they label you a terrorist, you don't have any constitutional rights. Okay. Do you remember when they captured Jesus? Help us, dear God. And they brought Christ to Pilate. And he told them, you just take him. You go judge him. Right? And what did they say? Since we have brought him, you need to judge him. And then he said, he has no rights. We found him perverting the nations. Question, did they give Christ a fair trial? Why? His rights were stripped away. Look with me, my friends. Chapter, chapter 6, chapter 5 of the Galatians. Where are we going to, my friends? So what's going to happen to God's people? Our rights are going to be stripped away. Oh, friends, we can't see it. Friends, sometimes I wonder if we're going to make it. Because some of us don't believe God's word. Sometimes I really wonder if our eyes are open or if we're still in darkness. I really wonder sometimes if when we come to church, if this is just entertainment for us. Lord, help us. I really wonder if we think, you know what, this thing is far off in the future. And sometimes I believe we have heard these things so often. So frequently that some of us say, oh, just another sermon. Just another Bible study. Friends, let me tell you something. Zephaniah says, before that decree comes, before the mark of the beast crisis, we must be seeking Christ's character, Christ's righteousness, Christ's meekness. Why seek it? Because naturally we don't have it. We seek something, why friends? We lack it. Because when church and state unite and they come to verbally and physically persecute us, friends, we cannot have any sinful thoughts towards our persecutors. I am not there yet. You are not there yet. And since we're so close to the end, this is what we should now be seeking. Look with me at verse number 20. Chapter 5 of Galatians. Verse number 20 says, All in us is uh, hatred. All of us are filled with anger, wrath, sedition, and strife. Friends, pause right here. Did any one of you encounter challenges, provocation this week? How did you respond? How did you respond? And God is showing us we're not ready for the crisis. And these warnings, sadly to say, is falling. They are falling on people who are still asleep. They come to church, but they come just to relax. My Lord, Lord help us. What more can I say, friends? What more can Christ say to get us ready? These signs are the clock on the wall to show us probation's hour is fast closing. It's time to seek this meekness. Self-control in a crisis. And the crisis is very, very close. Do I have it? Do you have Christ's meekness? I see my need. Do you see your need? Do you, friends? Skip on down to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Let's read. It's what? It's love. It's joy. It's peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. What else, friends? Meekness. Temperance. Against such, there is no condemnation. So who will give me the meekness? Who will give you the meekness? It is the Holy Spirit of God. I must ask for it daily because Moses had it for 40 years but lost it. Oh, friends, 
on the borders of the earth, the promised land. Every day I must ask for the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. And friends, it's called fruit, not fruits, plural. You either have all or none. It's like God's Ten Commandments, the law. If you are guilty, if you offend in one point, you are guilty of all the others. That means if someone provokes me and I have sinful thoughts, sinful words, sinful actions, I don't have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Oh, friends, can you see it? Go with me. Chapter 3 of Colossians. Where are we going to, my friends? Father in heaven, please, dear God, please, please, help us to see our need and to ask you daily for this experience. In Christ's name we pray. Look with me, friends. Where are we going to? The third chapter of Colossians, and look with me at verse number 9. Go back to verse number 8. Are we there? It says in verse 8, but now, let's read what it says. But now, you also put off what, friends? Let's read that. But now you also put off all these, what are they? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Skip on down to verse 10. What must we put on in verse 10? Put on the new man. How does the new man look? Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of what? Mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. And what is the next word? It's called meekness. And now, not only is Christ showing me, Andrew, you must put on the meekness, but you must keep it on. Is that clear, friends? Not only is Christ saying, put on the meekness, but you must keep it on. Why? What happened to Moses? Oh, friends, what happened to Moses? At the very borders of Canaan, he took it off. Took it all, friends. So now, how can I retain this meekness? Self-control in a time of provocation. Do you know how many times, friends, I'm provoked? Oh, beloved. Let's quote that. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. What it says. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find what? Rest unto your souls. Pause right there, friends. Pause right there. So how can I retain this meekness? I must learn of Jesus. How can you retain this meekness? You must learn of Christ. This is the punchline. Look with me, Isaiah chapter 53. Where are we going to, friends? Isaiah chapter 53. Let's learn of Christ then. Isaiah chapter 53. I must learn of Christ. He's meek and lowly in heart. I will find rest unto my souls, unto your souls. So when I go through provocations, people are verbally persecuting me. Do you know how many times people send me emails? You must stop preaching. Because you're leading God's people astray. And the flesh wants to rise up. And that's why I've learned to press check, delete. Because if I answer, I might give the wrong answer. And God is showing me when you are verbally chastised, you must learn to pray for your enemies. Pray for those who are chastising you, provoking you, because they don't want to learn truth. They want to provoke you. When you answer them negatively now, they take your words and blast it on social media. Look at what the pastor said to me. I won't give them that opportunity. I press check, delete. And some of the boldness to send me the email again. I realized you didn't answer my first email. Here it is again. And what do I do? Check, delete. 
I'm not strong. Look here. I must learn of Jesus. There is a time to speak and a time to be silent. Look at verse number seven. It says, he was oppressed. Is that Christ? He was oppressed and he was what? Afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth. He openeth not his mouth. And Christ showed me this in my secret place of prayer. Christ didn't just shut his mouth, but his mind had sinful thoughts. No. His mind was also pure, praying for his enemies. And when God is showing me sometimes, all of us, we might not say something condemnatory. You know where I'm going. To people who persecute us, but our thoughts, Lord have mercy. We are, we are boiling inside. If we're black, we turn red. If we're fair skinned, we turn yellow or purple. This is not meekness. He openeth not his mouth. Where was Christ brought? To as a lamb to a slaughter. Where was he? As a lamb to be slaughtered. Where was he? In the judgment hall. Follow me here. Look with me. Matthew 26. Where are we going to? In the judgment hall. I want to share with you as we close. Matthew what? Chapter my friends. Matthew 26. He was in the judgment hall as a lamb to the slaughter. Now. It says in Isaiah 53, he openeth not his uh, mouth. Did Christ keep his mouth shut all the time in that judgment hall? No. When he was asked about his relationship to his father, did he open his mouth to Pilate? Yes, he did. He presented present truth. A time to speak, time to be silent. So when we are brought before kings and rulers and churchmen in the halls of court, if they ask you about present truth, don't be silent. Don't be quiet. Speak up for Jesus. Amen, friend? But now, if they bring false witnesses, yes, and say, this man, this woman said ABC, and you know it's a lie. That's the time. Why? Do you know how many more? Do you know how many demons are going to be around you, friends? That is the time to be what? To be silent. Look at this. Look at this. Matthew 26, verse 60. Are we there? It says, verse 60, but found none. Yea, though many whom false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came whom two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? What is the next sentence in verse 63? But Jesus, friends, I want this experience, but Jesus held his peace. Now, this didn't say he held his mouth. No, he held his peace. His thoughts were under the control of the Father. He had peace. He was at rest. Friends, that is not weakness. That's meekness. Self-control, power from God to remain silent with no sinful thoughts. And friends, I've learned to do it this way. As I hear of people calling me a shepherd's rod, and I'm not. Calling me a fanatic, and I'm not an offshoot, and I'm not. I just say, Lord, I pray for them. Someone said, 
this, this pastor, Andrew Enriquez, before he began his ministry, he, he broke a church in two. He split that church in Claremont in two and bring the members down into Orlando. That's what the men were saying. And guess what? God allowed one, one of those elders to call me. I said, is that so? Did I do such thing? No, Pastor, it was a misunderstanding. The flesh wants to rise up now. But no offense, I've got to pray for them. I put their names even on my prayer list. Because this is to, is to pr prepare me for what is coming in these last days. Christ held his world peace. And friends, what was so startling? I was laughing and crying at the same time. Verse number 54 and verse 53. Christ said to Peter, Peter, put up your sword. Why? What did Peter do with his sword? It says he chopped off a man's ear. Why, friends? Did Peter have meekness? No, he didn't have self-control in a what? In a crisis. Chopped off the man's ear with a sword. And Christ said, Peter, put up your sword. The one who lives with the sword would die by the sword. Wait a minute. The sword is not just a weapon of offense, a physical, metal thing. No. The tongue, Lord have mercy. The tongue is likened unto a sword in the Bible. But the Bible says as a man thinks, so is he. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if I have sinful thoughts, if you have sinful thoughts, if I have sinful words, you have sinful words. For those who provoke us, the one who lives by the sword shall walk. Die by the sword. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And Christ then said to Peter, I could call 12 legions of angels right now. In other words, Christ had the power to just destroy them. And yet, he was praying for them. What is that? That's meekness, friends. In other words, when someone speaks ill about you, and you could just say, look, you did that to me? Okay, an eye for an eye. And you start blasting the negativity in their character. That's not meekness. That is weakness. But to know you have the power, you can just destroy them even more than how they are trying to malign your character. But you just have self-control. That is meekness, oh my friends. Mm, 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 mm. And this is what we must have before we die. Have it before the close of probation. Having meekness, Christ's power, self-control in a crisis before the mark of the beast crisis. Christ had this every single day of his earthly ministry. Moses for 40 years. Hear me now. But when Moses came to the borders, he lost it. Watch this. But when Christ came to Gethsemane. Oh. Ah, you see it, my brother. Moses for 40 years, a very meek man. At the borders of Canaan, he lost Christ's meekness. Jesus, every single day, 30, how many years? 33 years, meekness, meekness. But when he came to the crisis of the cross, we see him where? In Gethsemane. What was he praying? Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. 
What was he praying for? Oh, friends, power, self-control to go through the crisis of the cross. My Jesus received power. You're not hearing me. Yes, yes. That's why I, I have hope, friends. I can receive this meekness to make it in these last days. That's why you must also have hope. Christ received it. A testimony. You can receive it. I can receive it. But Christ had to pray how many times? Three times, meaning consistency. If I want, I have to be consistent in asking him for it. If you want it, you have to be consistent in asking him for it. Christ prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. Self is dead. Oh, friend, if a person is dead and you say, you remember when you were doing so and so to me, the dead hears nothing in the coffin. Praise God. You can come at the coffin and say, oh, I just want to tell you this. The dead knows nothing. If we die in Christ daily, when they say negative things, even if they persecute us, self will never respond. Praise God, friends. We must die how often, friends? Daily. Every day we must ask for it. Right now, do you see your need for it, friends? If so, come to the front right now. Let's plead for it. And not only ask for it, let's thank him for it. Ah, oh, friends, Jesus got the power for us. The meekness is ours. It's ours. Just come for it. And what I receive today cannot satisfy for tomorrow. Every single day, I must come for more. Every single day, you must come for more. What do you say, friends? Amen. Now, how many of you see your need for it? You have come, right? Even those online, safe to serve, do you see your need for it? This meekness, we must have it. Without it, we're not going to make it. You know, friends, let me say it this way. Many of us believe just because we come to church, because we have our Bibles, because we hold this office, that office, that we are okay. But when it comes down to fundamental Christianity, practical godliness, we lack. I mean practical godliness. The way how some of us husbands treat our wives, it shows we're not meek. Ask Hillary. Sometimes I walk outside. Yes, yes. And we catch ourselves because Satan, hear me, he wants to tempt everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. If that dragon could look at his own creator, Jesus, and tempt Jesus, who do we think we are? And sometimes I must catch myself, oh, because I'm a pastor. The devil won't come and tempt me. Uh -oh, is that so? If he was so bold to tempt Jesus, I need to watch and pray. My house would have to watch and pray. We have to catch ourselves. That's why Christ says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit of God is willing. The flesh is what? It's weak, my friend. Seek his righteousness. Seek his meekness because the flesh is weak. Practical godliness we lack. We lack it, friends. If the truth be told, if Christ right now was to write every person's name on this back wall with your sins and say, Lord, who is meek inside here? Who is not meek? Put their name right here. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord, whose name will be first, second, third on that wall, dear friends? It's me. It's me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother. You know it. It's me, oh, Lord, 
I see my need for this. Practical godliness. That's what the church lacks. The prophecies are just to show us, my friend, we are so close. Gather yourselves to Christ. The prophecies are to show us the clock on the wall. Probation's hour is fast closing. Time is running out. It's running out, friends. And some of us only have a name that we profess. But we are spiritually dead. Practical godliness we are. Void, deficient in practical godliness. Because if we were meek, guess what? There wouldn't be so much divisions even in the church. Someone said this to you and you want to chew them up one side of their body and down the next side. If someone cross us the wrong way, we don't hold our peace. No, we want to send out fiery darts. We draw the sword and we are ready now to commit murder. And if we cannot catch the person, we pull someone aside. And we're going to murder them in public. And then we come back to church and we sing, we are marching to Zion. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Practical godliness, my friends. That's what we lack as a church. If the husband was meek, if the wife was meek, there wouldn't be so much separations in the church. No, there wouldn't be such thing, friends. There wouldn't be such thing. Divorce in the church wouldn't be such thing. Because we are told if, 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 if pride, if selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would solve the marital problems. But pride, you have wounded me. You see, friends? So we have to draw the sword. You have wounded me, pride and selfishness, self-centeredness, self-interest. And then these same parties, husband and wife, claim to be Christians. And because they dress well, and they go to, let's say, a truthful church, they believe that they are okay. Sardis, Sardis, have a name that you live, you are dead. Pride must die. Self must die. How? Learn of me. So every day we're in the school of Christ. We learn because we're in the school of whom? The school of Christ. And to learn, he must give us problems. And just as how you are now standing, like, Pastor, I'm tired. So you must stand and kneel until you're tired. Put every weight on the stretch. Dear God, I'm tired of sinning. We're too comfortable, my friends. The decree is almost gone forth. Let me tell you what God just told me. Before that decree goes forward, seek my meekness. And that decree is not just that Sunday law crisis. That decree is this. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Holy Spirit, leave him alone. Leave King Saul alone. Leave Judas Iscariot alone before that decree goes forward. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. And that decree can go forth at any time. Judas, Christ said to him, what thou doest do quickly. Why? A decree was about to go forward. And when he left, it says it was night, darkness. But yet he was still living. Seek righteousness, my friends. Seek meekness before that decree goes forward. I see my need. Husbands, do you see? We are the husbands. Raise your hand. Put your hands down. Do you see your need? Send God the word. I see my need. Raise your hand. Send God the word. As a husband, I see my need, dear God. 
Give me this meekness. Wise, what about you? Do you see your need for Christ's meekness in the home? Send Christ the word. Raise the hand. The devil can't read your mind. Send Christ the word publicly. Let the devil see, hands down, you are clinging to God for strength. Frustrate him. Practical godliness. And the rest of us, do we see our need today? Do we see your need today, friends? Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Unless we have this self-control. Imagine meekness, but we're dealing with temperance. Self-control in a crisis. How many of us are going through crises? Raise your hand. Oh, friends, I'm going through them. How many of us, friends? What do we need? The meekness of Christ. Learn of him. So now, thank him daily for those trials. We're in his school. Amen, friends. Thank him for them. Father in heaven, Lord, what more can be said? Dear God, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. One day, very, very soon, people are going to want to hear another message of hope, warning, instruction, and it will be too late for them. And while mercy's sweet voice is still pleading with us to seek your righteousness, to seek your meekness, help us even now to surrender all to you. Our hands were raised, sending you the word, the signal, dear God, we see our need. Grant us your righteousness. Grant us your meekness. Help us to believe as we are surrendered, today we have your righteousness. Today we have your meekness. Help us not to doubt that. And when tomorrow comes, help us to come for another measure of your righteousness. Another measure of your meekness. Because we want this experience daily. Save our homes. Save our children. Help all of us to make it into that new earth is our prayer. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.